Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Overcoming Chronic Illness podcast. My name is Dr. Brian Reid, and I'm a naturopathic doctor, and I'm very happy to be joined today by another naturopathic colleague, Dr. Casey Holland. And Dr. Holland, if you wouldn't mind giving a quick introduction to our uh, listeners, that would be wonderful, please. Great. Thank you for having me, Dr. Reid. I admire your work, so I'm honored to be chatting with you today. You. I'm Dr. Casey Holland. I have a practice in Northwest Montana, and I am also a naturopathic doctor that specializes in complex chronic illness and getting patients from non-functioning to functioning. Much of my work has been associated with Epstein-Barr virus and helping patients uncover the root causes of Epstein-Barr virus. And that is what I speak most about. Fantastic. Yeah, that's definitely what I see on your Instagram. Um, it's you're, you're apparently I'm, I'm in your algorithm or something like that. And the, by the Instagram powers that be is I see your posts all the time. And um, yeah, and I, I'd like to pick your brain about the Epstein-Barr virus side of things, um, amongst other things, we won't uh, pigeonhole you into the Epstein-Barr uh, world. Um, but uh, just before we jump into that, could you just uh, tell listeners a little bit about how you got into treating folks with complex chronic illness? Definitely. I I found naturopathic medicine as a child. I was fortunate enough that my mother had always kind of had a naturopathic physician since before I was born. She was told that she would never be able to have children. And then she had um, an appointment with a naturopathic doctor and three months later got pregnant with me. So our family always was exposed to the medicine. And as a child, I had a really bad case of mono. Um, Epstein-Barr virus is the virus responsible for mono. And I missed about three months of school and had a lot of work to do. And thankfully, naturopathic medicine really helped me with that. But then when I got older, I started experiencing reactivations and I didn't realize it at first I was in college or it, it also happened in naturopathic medical school. And I wasn't home with my naturopathic doctor and, uh, a lot of doctors didn't know what was going on and I didn't either until further down the line when um, when I was in residency actually. And, and then I also experienced kind of the things that cause Epstein-Barr virus. When I look back, I can see, oh, that was probably mold or that was probably this. And so from my own experience and realizing how often I had just decided that I was just tired from from being busy and I needed to just keep going and I needed to be more motivated. It really opened my eyes to how many patients were also feeling that way. And we're also being told that they're just tired. It's, it's not anything. I mean, if you have experienced Lyme disease or mold illness or Epstein-Barr virus, you know, that the tired is a whole other level of fatigue. And so I developed a passion to just start with just bringing awareness to it. And it grew from there to what I mainly see patients for. So it's such a common tale, right? It's like we are afflicted with something and that motivates us to help others with that something and and, and then some you know, beyond that. Um, one of the things I um, enjoy about your posts like on social media is that you, you know, semi-regularly mention how it's not or actually I'd say regularly, not even semi-regularly mention how it's, you know, it's not just about the Epstein-Barr virus. So, you know, there's, there's more to it. You need more than just that ingredient to, have complex chronic illness. So um, would you mind um, just kind of explaining to folks um, like in what or how Epstein-Barr virus itself can cause chronic health issues and then maybe tie that answer into how it can interplay with other factors that can cause it to really blow up and be really um, impactful or devastating for some patients? Yeah, I think that's a really good place to start and something important to highlight. I think the reason that Epstein-Barr virus has gotten so much attention is I'm sure that you see this too with your patients where you have somebody that's been chronically ill and they're looking for answers, looking for answers. And then finally a doctor runs an EBV panel and they find that. And from there, so that the Epstein-Barr virus test, when somebody runs a complete panel is an easy way, like it's a, it's a blood draw conventional doctors, some will run it. And so it's kind of a starting point where it's like, oh, we have EBV. And I think then is what happens is a lot of patients then 
don't have proper support or understanding what that means. And they think all my symptoms are from this virus. And Epstein-Barr virus, for those of you listening that might be new to it, um, it's human herpes virus four, it's from the herpes family virus. And that's a family of viruses that is opportunistic and stays in our body. And so part of that means that our body should be able to keep it in an inactive state or what doctors call a latent state. And what we see happening is it going into an active state and causing problems. We have research showing its association with autoimmune conditions with different cancers. And so if we just intervene and just look at Epstein-Barr virus, then it's reactivated. Then a lot of times I don't see patients get better um, because we can't just completely rid your body of it. Whatever is causing it to be in an active state will continue and it will continue to cause symptoms and reactivations. So we have to look underneath that. And what I have kind of summed it up as as things that cause oxidative stress in the body. And that's an imbalance of antioxidants available for your body to clear out what happens in our normal day-to-day basis of toxin exposure, stress. Um, If you've had trauma or a car accident, um, if you have Lyme disease or mold exposure, all of those things can add up and they get to a point where your body can't handle it anymore. And then Epstein-Barr virus can reactivate. So if we just deal with that Epstein-Barr virus and just chalk everything up to that, usually patients don't feel better in my experience. That has been my experience too. Um, On that note, just out of curiosity, um, have you had patients where either with another clinician, they just worked with antivirals, be they, you know, pharmaceutical or non-pharmaceutical or a combination thereof, or your own patients, um, maybe, maybe in your earlier days of like, oh, let's just kind of go after the virus before we start tackling all this other stuff. Um, have you had patients where they've had a really good or at least notable clinical improvement just working with antivirals out of the gate, or does it, has it always kind of fallen on its face? I think that, in acute settings where somebody had um, the Epstein-Barr virus reactivate from something very specific, like a stressful life event or um, say a car accident, and they may not have had, that was the main trigger, then I do have seen people with antiviral therapies do better. I would say one thing that I've seen be really great. And I think it's also because it has other actions aside from just antiviral, but antioxidants is IV vitamin C. Mm. Uh, But in general, when I was first in residency, we were at a clinic that specialized in a lot of complex things. And so it was pretty standard to run a viral panel. Mm -hmm. And I saw a lot of those patients do, um, you know, intensive supplement lists with antivirals, or ozone or IV vitamin C and not have improvement. Mm -hmm. And then those patients, typically when I look back at them, it was like, oh, they weren't being treated for mold or parasites or something else. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, this is a good time for me to mention that everything that we're chatting about today is for informational purposes only. None of this should be construed as medical advice. And please, anyone listening, please talk to your healthcare provider about any medical advice that you might need. Um, So uh, kind of dovetailing on what you said just a minute ago. um, So let's say you had a, there was a patient, like hypothetical patient who, you know, had, um, you know, has some let's say they had a notable mold exposure. They're, you know, super sick from that. Um, they've moved out of that environment to, let's say it was their home. So they moved out of that environment. They're still super sick. Um, you run some testing and you see that they have this EBV reactivation or chronic EBV or whatever it happens to be. Um, and you know that they still have um, some ongoing need for mold treatment as well. Um, generally, would it be the most successful um, in your experience to bring in some antivirals and mold treatment simultaneously in a case like that? Or do you treat the mold first? And then if things don't fully clear up, then you bring in the antivirals or do you antiviral a little bit first and for a couple of weeks to maybe try to drop viral titers and then bring in mold treatment? Like what would your, uh, you know, obviously every patient is a special snowflake, but um, what would your general approach be uh, with a case like that? Yeah, I, I approach both of them. 
However, I guess not quite 50, 50 more 70, 30 with 70 on the mold, Mm -hmm. mainly because when we're dealing with mold, it causes so much oxidative stress Mm -hmm. in the body. Um, It's just, it's really hard on the liver and everything that we need to really be dealing with EBV. It's immunosuppressive. And so definitely focus on that. And sometimes I, if I use an antiviral, whatever mode it may be, whether it's IV vitamin C or natural or pharmaceutical during that time, it's too much for the body to handle and patients kind of feel awful. Um, so the way that I like to address it is really dealing with the inflammation that Epstein-Barr virus also causes so that while we're clearing out some of that mold and getting the patient to a place where they can handle that more, that we're addressing those pathways that are specific to autoimmune conditions and things. So we don't hopefully have that happen again, though, like you said, every patient is different. So if somebody you know, if they are handling the mold well, then I might be more aggressive with that antiviral approach right away. Um, that makes sense. Um, and could you touch a little bit on like just what type of um, pathways that you'd be kind of trying to target um, that you were referring to a minute ago? Yeah, there's the, the NF kappa B pathway and the JAK stat pathway are both linked with autoimmune conditions and cancers, and Epstein Barr virus causes those to be more rampant. Um, so things like, and again, like Dr. Raid said, this is not medical advice. Make sure to check with your provider before adding anything in. But things like curcumin are really great at blocking those pathways. And actually we do see some inhibitory effects to different proteins associated with Epstein-Barr virus with curcumin. So using things like that is not what we typically think of for, you know, killing a virus, Um, but it can be really beneficial and preventative of further progression. Um, In terms of like kind of the clinical impact of that, like, so if you have a patient and let's say again, hypothetically, like, you know, so they're at, we'll say it's the same patient, you know, they were in mold, they're out of mold now, you know, they have EBV reactivation. So let's say you've got them on, you know, say a low, low dose antiviral, you've got them on some binders, you maybe have them on some phase one, phase two, phase 2.5 detox support um, to start, you know, mobilizing mycotox or eliminating mycotoxins, kind of draining that bucket um, so that, you know, they're on that protocol. They're not really seeing like a whole lot of clinical change yet. Again, some patients at that point would be like, oh, I feel like a million bucks or someone would be noticing a change. Let's just say in this case, like you're just kind of laying the groundwork, they're tolerating it, but I haven't seen a whole lot of clinical change yet. If at that point you were to add in something like curcumin, um, would you, uh, what percentage of the time roughly, like, would you find like, oh, that addition of something like curcumin where you're um, inhibiting some of those inflammatory pathways, what percentage of the time would you see the patient saying, oh yeah, like that's finally like made a difference for me? Or is it more that it doesn't really make much of a difference? It's more that it lays the foundation. So they're going to be able to better tolerate next steps with the treatment protocol. I would say, well, some patients with Epstein-Barr virus and mold do have a lot more aches and pains Mm -hmm. and whatnot. And that might be one of the first things that we notice if we're adding that in is there's a decrease in, in joint pain and discomfort with Mm -hmm. something like curcumin. But to me, that's more of a baseline protective layer and not necessarily something that I would say moves the needle significantly right away. Mm -hmm. Um, Usually with things like this, and I'd love to hear what what you see with your patients too, but it's, it's having everything on board. (laughs) Um, it's getting movement going, getting lymph moving, making sure that they're having bowel movements every day, having that anti-inflammatory. And sometimes it takes time, especially if we've, I mean, some of my patients come to me and they're like, I haven't felt good for 20 years. And the thought of just going for a walk every day is too much to ask of them. Mm -hmm. And so if we're at that state, then it takes more time because the lymph hasn't been moving. All these things have had time to really settle in. And so some of the biggest things that I see with moving the needle and improvements 
specifically with like energy or whatnot is if we get them in an infrared sauna, because mm. then we start circulation and things like that. Um, some of, some of those things are what I see the biggest symptom improvement in, mm-hmm. but not necessarily clearing out, you know, the, the virus or being antiviral specifically, mm-hmm. but when it comes to having people feel better, what I've found is that it's all the things together, which mm-hmm. is why I think it is so difficult to help patients overcome this because that is difficult to manage in life, right? To be doing supplements, to be doing sauna, um, whether it be financial restrictions, time restrictions, or if you're a busy mom and you have five kids, how do you find time to do that for yourself? Mm -hmm. And so it hasn't been just, oh, I add in curcumin and, and things all of a sudden get better. But I do think that it's an important foundation for protecting uh, the body from going into a more inflamed state. That's really well said. And, um, I, I think it's just an important thing for, um, uh, listeners to be aware of, um, you know, just because, um, a supplement or a treatment doesn't make a obvious clinical impact out of the gate, you know, sometimes it's because it's kind of that foundational layer that's being supported and, and hopefully clinicians are explaining that to their patients so that the patient knows, you know, what, what their expectation should be. Um, I've had so many patients come in to see me over the years. We're like, Oh, like I was prescribed this and this and this and like, well, did it make a clinical difference in how you felt? And it's like, well, no, it didn't, or, or, or yes, it did, or, or whatever it happens to be. But, um, I, I found clinically myself that it's, it's relatively rare that something like curcumin will move the needle. But yeah, when you look at all the, you know, the literature, and what makes sense on paper. Like it's, you know, um, I know that, uh, if memory serves, like Dr. Paul Anderson is one of your mentors as well. I think he's a mentor to like our entire profession pretty much. And like, I know he just talks about the virtues of curcumin all the time. And it's like, Oh, wonderful. Like I don't see it making a huge clinical difference in and of itself in the moment, but as a foundational piece of things can be really helpful. I'm um, kind of on that note. Um, I have these other questions I want to get to, but keep more, keep coming up as we're talking, um, just in the last uh, couple of years, um, uh, there's in my experience anyways, at least in the circles that I run in or my social media algorithms or whatnot. Um, I've been seeing a lot more, uh, talk about like, you know, curcumin and NAC. And when we look at some of these nutraceuticals, like there, there seems to be a lot of overlap, especially curcumin and, um, sorry, maybe I misspoke or I meant to say quercetin and NAC in case I said curcumin again, I think there's a lot of overlap to my understanding in terms of how quercetin and curcumin affect some of these, um, biological pathways. Have you, are there other nutraceuticals beyond curcumin that you kind of lump into that same category, um, to say, oh yeah, like if a patient say just couldn't tolerate curcumin, for example, like, are there other things that would be in that same kind of category that you might consider? Yeah. Uh, curcumin can at times for, for patients listening or, or providers that are, you know, depending on where you're at in your natural medicine training, um, curcumin can move heavy metals. So sometimes that can be, uh, patients can feel an increase in symptoms and that can be a tip, right? If you give them curcumin and they don't feel better and they, or they feel worse. Um, so other ones that I, uh, have that I, go to depending on what system the patient is being most affected by, uh, resveratrol, NAC, quercetin, selenium, glutathione, all of those people think of selenium just for thyroid, but it also is, is just a major antioxidant. And it actually paired with vitamin C helps recycle glutathione, which most of us have heard of glutathione, our body's major antioxidant. So especially with mold, I usually always implement glutathione, but then again, glutathione can also, because it can be helping with detox patients. Sometimes if you're, they're really sensitive, especially with mold, we see this rebound effect of where the things that you need and are good for you tend to cause an increase in symptoms. Uh, So sometimes we have to start those really low or start with something more gentle, um, so if we don't have heavy metals, things like that present, a lot of times curcumin is better tolerated in my experience than glutathione or NAC, because both of those can also open up biofilms, which <laughs> we just keeps going there's more. And, and so, but yeah, we do have a selection there in variety 
of, of antioxidants that we can use. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so kind of circling back to, you know, patients going to get tested per, for EBV. Um, I know our healthcare systems are dramatically different between the U S and Canada. Um, in many ways, um, one of the challenges that we have here, and this is to my understanding, but at least being in Nova Scotia and lots of, uh, patients in surrounding provinces, but my understanding of it is that, um, they're through our, um, sort of social healthcare system. Like you can't get a complete EBV panel. Um, they're really only able to test for, um, whether a patient has, um, acute EBV, um, IE, like you have mono right now. And I know, you know what this means, Dr. Holland, but, uh, uh just for listeners here, make sure everybody's uh, talking about the same language here. Um, so either telling us if you have a mono right now, or you had it at some point in the past, um, there's no way to test for, um, whether there's been like a reactivation or there's indications of chronic chronic EBV, um, we thankfully have access to private labs that we can get comprehensive panels done through. Um, but just for um, folks who are listening, um, and again, just for informational purposes only, um, would you be able to just speak to what a complete EBV panel um, would, would entail? Yeah, I think it's a little similar here. I mean, we have it available, but most conventional doctors are going to only run uh, um, what we call a mono spot, mm. and that includes the IgM. So you can think of M with your antibodies as the mother of antibodies, and they're the first antibodies that show up to respond to an infection. And so a lot of times, if we see that be negative, then okay, well you well you don't have this. But is what happens is then we have other antibodies that show up from the G family, so IgG. And those can still be positive. We also in a complete panel have an early antigen and that one is pretty specific to reactivation. If it's positive, then we kind of assume initial infection or reactivation. I guess you can, it can be there with the initial infection. However, generally they aren't testing it anyway with an initial infection. Um, but so a complete panel for me is there's also different parts of the virus that the antibodies are responding to. So there's the viral capsid portion, and then there's the actual nuclear antigen material of the virus. So for me, that's the viral capsid antigen uh, or antibody IgM. And then on a lab, this will look like VCA IgM, and then it will be VCA IgG, nuclear antigen IgG, and then early antigen IgG. And if you run that whole panel, a lot of times it won't, still won't be black and white, um, is what happens is say we have the IgM be negative, and then we have the early antigen be negative, and then we see the soldier cells, the IgGs be positive, doctors will say, well, that's just a past infection. There's nothing, no, no sign of reactivation, but what happens is a lot of times I see those IgGs be 600 times like the upper limit of normal, like just crazy high or off the charts or, or whatnot. And if the patient is also symptomatic, then we have to use our understanding of what we know about EBV this far in the patient's presentation and not just what we see on paper. So I think we need a lot of work, um, around testing in this and, and immunology, uh, with, with how this works, because it also is, there's a timeline where, you know, the early antigen is usually positive three to six months. I can show you labs where it's been positive for years and where the IgM is still positive for years. And so these textbook checks and boxes that we have for how the lab panels are supposed to come out and what it means aren't really adding up for, for what I've seen. And I've looked at probably thousands of EBV panels now, and we have to listen to the patient and put together the history and symptoms and, and what we see there. So that's the very muddy gray answer to that question. <laughs> 
can't really get a better color answer to that question. I don't think it's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's complicated, but that's a good, good answer. Um, just on the topic of lab testing and in EBV, um, are there other viruses that you would uh, often, like say a patient comes in, you know, complex chronic illness patient, um, are there other viruses that you would be running on a viral panel commonly? Yeah, if I could run a full viral panel on every patient and have the data, I would love to do that. It does, it is financially expensive. So since Epstein-Barr virus is from the herpes family virus, I run um, HSV-1, HSV-2, and then also a lot of times cytomegalovirus runs with Epstein-Barr virus. So I'll run those ones. Um, we also have seen... Um, Depending on symptoms, I have seen parvovirus be very associated with joint pain. So if somebody is presenting with a lot of joint pain, we may do that one. And then if sometimes if it's not an option financially to be that thorough with labs, we just always have those in the back of our mind that, okay, if EBV is reactivated, it's very likely that this person is having other infections or say, um, oftentimes I have a patient that says also I get a cold sore, you know, every month or cyclically, then it's pretty clear that mm -hmm. HSV1 is most likely there. So oftentimes, and that again, when patients get diagnosed with Epstein Barr virus, um, it's not just that these viruses, if you're susceptible to EBV, you most likely are susceptible to others as well. Mm -hmm. That's definitely been my experience too. Um, and just clinically, um, like, let's say you have a patient, lots of symptoms, you run a viral or you, yeah, you run a viral panel. And if you see that, oh, they, you know, quote unquote, just have EBV, um, or they have, you know, EBV and HHV six and HHV eight and HHV three and like all the HHVs, um, would it meaningfully change your treatment protocol in terms of therapeutics that you would use? When we have for example, if we have a lot from the herpes family virus, then I do lean more towards the valacyclovir family of pharmaceuticals because it is very studied for those. And mm -hmm. um, traditionally from a pharmaceutical perspective, pretty safe considering mm -hmm. um, not for, I mean, there's always nuances and, and whatnot and don't take that as 100%, but and, and I have seen, we use that and, oh, I feel better. And so with something like that, it also is oftentimes more affordable for the patient than say doing um, all these supplements mm -hmm. and feeling overwhelmed. And so sometimes that's a really good option. Mm -hmm. And if there's more um, mycoplasma pneumonia, we didn't speak of that, but that's a common bug that runs with EBV2 um, bacterial, um, then I might not lean as much towards an antiviral pharmaceutical, but something different or using herbs, because the thing with herbs and botanical medicine that I know Dr. Raid knows and is very skilled in is that they're, they have multiple actions. So you can have herbs that are going to fight mold and viruses and bacteria sometimes. And so if we need more of a broad spectrum, then sometimes botanical medicine can be a better choice for that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're so darn good at multitasking. Like you can't yeah. find an herb that does one thing. It, they just don't exist. <laughs> but um, so just to clarify, like, um, so if they had, if there was someone who had multiple viruses, um, you'd be more inclined to like, so say if they had, let's say they didn't have mycoplasma, like it's, you know, the, say it's our patient from the move there to the moldy house. And, um, you know, they just test positive for EBV or they test positive for EBV and four other viruses Would the presence of multiple viruses push you more into that valciclovir mode, just because like, oh my gosh, your viral load is just so crazy. Let's just bring out the big guns kind of thing. Um, or whereas if it was just EBV, would you be more inclined to use a non-pharmaceutical approach or would, I'm just wondering, does the number of viruses, um, make a difference in terms of how, uh, what you'd be choosing to prescribe? Yeah, I would say if there's EBV and uh, another opportunistic viral infections from, the, especially from the herpes family yep. that I usually go with valacyclovir. Okay. And I, I definitely have 
learned um, from Dr. Paul Anderson, mm-hmm. the dosing and things that are appropriate with, with that. And mm-hmm. because for those of you listening, um, we try to, we try to use pharmaceuticals and make sure that we have research supporting their usage and valacyclovir is not, it's not studied specific for Epstein-Barr virus. So that's why this is kind of, you know, we're talking about, well, do you, you know, do we do it? Do we not? Uh, but it, but we do have good research with it for HSV-1 and cold sores and things like that. And so with our clinical knowledge that we're drawing on and with, uh, what I have learned from other doctors, like Dr. Raid and Dr. Paul Anderson that have been in practice for a long time, and they have seen positive outcomes with it. We lean more into that and use it. And that's again, where we have to use our, the research that we have available, the patient presentation, and then our own understanding of viruses and Mm -hmm. immunology to, to date. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, um, uh, I, I know I mentioned, I think before our chat that I didn't want to pigeonhole you into talking about EBV. I do want to talk to you about some <laughs> other topics as well. I mean, we've, we've touched on other ones already, but, um, the one last, uh, I might have another one later, but the last EBV question for now, if you don't mind. Um, so some labs, um, at least, well, one lab anyways, that I know of offers uh, testing for like T cell levels, like an LE spot test mm-hmm. for EBV. And I'm just wondering, and just for listeners, um, so uh, what we've been talking about up to this point has all been antibody testing, um, T cells or another type of immune system cell. And, um, do you, in your opinion, is there, or in your experience, is there a place for T cell testing or, um, yeah, yay, nay, or is the jury out on that? I think that it is valuable. And so EBV, we originally kind of thought of it just as the, as infecting B cells, because, and that was what it was like claim to fame was the first human tumor virus causing Burkitt's lymphoma really associated with B cells, but it can infect B cells, T cells, and natural killer cells. And in there, there are some more aggressive strains, it seems of Epstein-Barr virus that affect more cells. Um, and so if we have somebody that really just isn't making any improvement, um, sometimes it can be because the virus is infecting B cells, T cells, and natural killer cells. And so having a test like that can be helpful for that. I will say that I haven't used that test a lot because it's not super available. Hopefully it's becoming more available. I think the last couple of years it is, and that you know, for most of my patients, um, it wouldn't be covered by insurance unless, unless their primary care provider or I had ran the proper full panel and we see that, and then they have other, you know, other symptoms. Um, so, but especially if we're concerned about, you know, what we would call, so there's a definition difference with reactivated Epstein-Barr virus and chronic Epstein bar virus. It's a lot more aggressive and it's thought to only affect um, a certain population and actually be more common in like Asia, not even the United States. And so it really isn't tested for very much. But I think that testing like that would be appropriate for patients that really aren't making any progress or are showing signs of, you know, developing autoimmune conditions rapidly and having this virus and things like that, I think that that would be appropriate. And I hope that we get more clear understanding of, of that in coming times. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, Oh, geez. I I think I'm still going to talk about EBV here uh, for a (laughs) minute. Um, so, um, what, uh, you mentioned that one of the negative uh, impacts that EBV can have on the body is increasing our oxidative stress. Um, and uh, to my understanding, one of the other uh, significant ways that EBV and other viruses can affect our physiology is by inhibiting our mitochondrial function. Um, mm-hmm. I'm sure you're very familiar with the work of Dr. Robert Navio and his cell danger response um, theory. And um, and just really paraphrasing uh, broadly here, um, essentially the virus can ultimately cause the cell to go into a lockdown mode. Um, and part of that is the mitochondria, which are 
responsible for, for producing virtually all of the energy for the cell amongst many other important functions um, really kind of goes into this lockdown mode. Um, so you can imagine if the little structures that make all of your energy are not cranking out that energy, then, well, you're going to feel really, really tired. Um, and furthermore, the systems in your body are not going to work properly because all of our systems need energy in order to run properly. So um, in terms of mitochondrial health and physiology, um, could you speak to some of the um, tests that you might recommend for your patients to assess their mitochondrial health? Um, if you use any tests, I know um, many of us don't necessarily do that, but uh, do you use any tests to assess mitochondrial health? Or if not um, lab tests, are there any types of metrics that you would use to assess their mitochondrial function? Yeah, I have each of my patients do uh, like a questionnaire that's kind of specific to that if they're presenting for chronic illness, because um, that helps me and is important to me. And I can refer back to it during treatment to, to see how we're improving. Um, the organic acids test has a panel for mitochondrial function, and that can be helpful. And it, with that, um, and then the, there's a test for, it's more related to oxidative stress, but I think that when we have a chronic viral presentation and I think the oxidative stress in and it of itself is like a, also a marker for mitochondrial health, right? Um, so it's called 808D, 808DG. I think that's the abbreviated form. It is. Um, yeah. It's, it's a mouthful. Um, I'm glad. That yeah, I don't want to try acronym. and say the whole yeah, word. Yeah. I, I butcher it. If I was really time. mean, I'd ask you to say it, but I wouldn't want to. Either. You can say it. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's okay. No, but yeah, sorry. I interrupted yet. Yeah, so. Um. And then the other one that can be more of a standard marker that we can easily get that I like to look at is reverse T3. Anytime that is creeping up above mid range, to me, that's the body. I guess I should start, I should back, back pedal a little bit. So this is in a th thyroid panel. If you do a complete thyroid panel and usually we want active T3 because that is what your body uses to help fuel your mitochondria and to heal and to function. And when your body is in what Dr. Raid is referring to as a cell danger response, your body is like, Hey, we are not making any more T3. You need to conserve energy. We need to cut back. We need to protect you. And it starts to make an inactive form of reverse T3. So if we see that creeping up, that can also be assigned to me of mitochondrial damage. And that can be a, in a standard blood panel that we do with your thyroid and isn't an added on functional lab, like the organic acid test is. Um, with the reverse T3, um, is it something that you see like kind of creeping up commonly in your patients or is it like just every once in a while? I would say um, that it's rare that it isn't. So I was trained that if it is above like mid range, that mm -hmm. we consider that significant. Mm -hmm. And even though it wouldn't be flagged, um, and I would say that that is more likely than not with my patients with Epstein-Barr virus, okay. and which is the, the, oh, go ahead. Sorry, no, which sorry, is an no, indicator was, of the mitochondrial stress that yeah. we're talking about. Yeah. yeah, no, it's a really clever indicator. Um, and do you find that like, you know, if say, um, I don't know if you had a room full of a hundred patients, they with, you know, complex chronic illness, they're. Um, our reverse T3 is above like the, you know, sort of halfway mark with a reference range. Um, all those hundred patients are feeling dramatically better. Um, what percentage of them would you estimate would, uh, like in your experience, would you say, oh, we can actually see their reverse T3 kind of like getting into the lower, um, half of the range now. Um, like, does it, is it like always works out that way or is it sometimes not a, a sensitive barometer for some folks? Well, I think it's as sensitive or more sensitive than follow-up EBV panels because we see patients feel better and their antibodies often haven't changed right away. And that can take a very long time for it to change. And so sometimes I see the reverse T3 change before that, I would say. Um, I don't have a specific percentage off the top of my head. It's also, again, in a perfect world, we would run all these labs on everybody and be able to speak to the data. Mm -hmm. But again, if, 
if sometimes I start with those things and work on those things, and then I don't always have the follow-up that I would like because patient's feeling better and they don't want to pay more money out of pocket for a test, right? Of course. So, so I don't feel like I have a solid percentage on that, but I do think that it is a good indicator and that sometimes it responds before the actual viral panel does. Yeah. Cool. No, that's great. Yeah. I'm, I'm asking uh, in part for the audience's sake and in part because um, I hadn't um, heard of or thought of using reverse T3 to kind of track before. So I know with some things like say an organic acid test, I find with some patients, it's really useful. You know, we see extreme uh, uh, abnormalities with some of their mitochondrial markers and then on follow-up testing, they look better. And again, many patients don't want to pay for the follow-up test because they're feeling good. And I don't want to ask them to pay for the follow-up test. So we don't get those data points all, you know, super, super often, but I've had some patients where we've done a baseline organic acid test. Um, and you know, it's, it's somewhat off kilter, then they're feeling a lot better. We redo the test, uh, you know, say months or, you know, a couple of years down the line is just like, Oh, let's just make sure everything's looking good on paper now. And like their numbers look worse than they did before. So it doesn't always have like a, I find it's not, <clears throat> there's some tests that I find are incredibly linear and predictable, like, you know, heavy metals, your metals are elevated, you start chelating and, you know, with obviously there's nuances there too, but generally it's going to just linearly go down, um, with, uh, something like an organic acid test. I find it's not with, uh, those mitochondria markers, not always quite as reliable as I'd like it to be it is for some patients, not for everybody. So I was just wondering how, how, uh, reliable the reverse T3 tracking was, but it, it sounds like it's pretty, pretty useful from what you're saying. Uh, which is great. Um, I wouldn't expect it to get worse unless, mm-hmm. you know, there's things that we weren't covering, but yeah, my experience has been very similar. And sometimes, sometimes even the viral panel will be worse because their immune system is working. So then their titers look higher and they can see that and panic, but really it's not a bad thing because maybe their immune system was suppressed from mold and out working. Mm-hmm. So how we, how we interpret those lab tests is, is complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've sometimes lamented that, you know, why couldn't we all just be single celled organisms in Petri dishes? It'd be so much easier (laughs) to treat, but life would be so boring. So, you know, probably not a good trade-off. Yeah. Um, so if you have a patient and they are, uh, let, let's say, you know, we'll go back to our, our, our example patient. So, you know, they're, you've got them phased onto their mold protocol. Um, they're working with some antivirals and, um, so they've got those pieces of the puzzle in place. And let's just say for argument's sake that they're, you know, kind of improving, but at like, you know, sort of a, a, a modest rate, um, let's say they're improving, you know, maybe by. 10% a month or something like that, uh, which isn't, isn't terrible, but it's a little slow, let's say, um, their main symptoms are fatigue and brain fog and, and joint pain, let's say. Um, so, uh, if you, uh, at what point would you be thinking would, at that point, would you be thinking, okay, I've got my antiviral protocol in place. I've got my mold protocol in place. Um, you know, they're making some headway, but I'd like to speed things along. Would you be thinking about mitochondrial support at that point? Would you have already had it in place before getting the other parts of the protocol in place? Would you be thinking, no, no, a scenario like that, I'd be doing X, Y, or Z before I'd get to mitochondrial support. I'm wondering, uh, where, where the mito support would fit into that, um, series of events, give or take. I usually think of mitochondrial support right away, um, depending on how sick they've been, unless it is a very acute presentation where, Hey, this happened and this reactivated, and this isn't like a chronic picture. Mm -hmm. The thing with mitochondrial support that I've found though, is that, um, first we have to make the mitochondrial feel safe. Um, and I'm really still, I think we're also learning on the best ways to do that because I also have given people mitochondrial support. And it could be that, oh, they have a lot of gastrointestinal things and they're not absorbing well. And I I feel like they're probably not getting much benefit from it, or I give it to them and, you know, nothing happens. Um, but usually that is something that I'm applying from the beginning and having on board, especially with mold Mm -hmm. at the bare minimum, you know, a a B vitamin complex so that the mitochondria are getting food that they want and need. Um, But to make the, the mitochondria feel safe, I think, so there are some herbs that can help with that, like school cap. Um, And also though, I think that sometimes 
depending on the patient experience and what has been going on, we may need to be working on their limbic system because their body is just stuck in a fight mode from this chronic illness and the way that they're going through life with their, their brain is overreactive because it's trying to protect them from another toxin or another mold exposure. Uh, we see this present with uh, a lot of times with mold patients where they can smell mold a mile away. I remember when I was healing from mold, I would be in going into a shopping mall and be like, I need to get out of here now. Wow. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and nobody else would smell it. You don't smell that. I'm not buying anything from here. It smells like mold. Mm-hmm. Um, so our brain, I mean, our body is amazing. It wants us to heal. It wants us to be aware. And so if we're having things like that, then we might need to be working on limbic system retraining and, and, and stress modulation so that you feel safe. Um, the other thing that I think is worth mentioning that I have found with mitochondria that I feel like is very harmful to them and oftentimes gets missed because we're looking at infections and mold and EBV is glyphosate and pesticide exposure. Mm -hmm. And so if we're dealing with these infections, but we haven't dealt with that and that's still there, then I think it's really hard for them to improve. So yeah, I I always think about that from the beginning. Um, But sometimes I don't supplement a lot of mitochondrial support until maybe after we've done some detox on glyphosate or healed their gastrointestinal tract so that they're absorbing better so that we're not just giving them supplements and not seeing results. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that again is, I think hopefully listeners, when they listen to this are are getting the idea that this really is not something that is a cookie cutter protocol. That's step one, step two, step three. It's more like, um, you know, it's like an art where we're putting a little here and then we're changing and we're thinking of how the patient responds. And yes, we pay attention to lab results and research and all of that and our thinking from that perspective, but then also relying on what we have seen and what is right in front of us. I think you're effectively transmitting that message um, that it's definitely not cookie cutter. So yeah, I think mission accomplished and right, rightly so. so. If only it was cookie cutter, it'd be a lot easier for everybody, but say la vie. Um, all right. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to ask you a little bit about histamine. Um, I've uh, been asking all of my guests about histamine because I'm hoping that somebody has some um, um, mast cell stabilizers or other antihistamine supports that I haven't heard of yet. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping you'll have uh, some magic up your sleeve, um, Dr. Holland. Um, so uh, I, I'm, and I shouldn't assume, I suppose, but I, I'm, I am assuming that you see patients with mast cell activation syndrome because it's kind of hard to not see them if you're treating mold. Um, and, um, uh, and so in, when it comes to patients who are symptomatic with, you know, histamine issues, um, are there outside of like kind of the standard go-to pharmaceutical antihistamines, like your, you know, H1 or H2 receptor blockers or your, um, you know, chromium sodium or catodifin, um, or your standard, uh, or, you know, sort of more typical, um, non-pharmaceutical antihistamine support or mast cell stabilizing support, like say quercetin or luteolin or PEA, um, are there, are there other agents that are maybe not as, as well known that you work with when it comes to helping to try to uh, work to mitigate uh, histamine symptoms? Yeah, I've had a lot of, um, success with skull cap hmm. and, um, I think I learned, I learned that, at, there was a chronic illness conference. I think it was AMP with mm-hmm. one of the speakers there mm-hmm. and started using that and actually used it personally as well, because I, um, I was not clinically diagnosed with mast cell activation syndrome because, uh, for those of you listening, it's really actually difficult to diagnose. You have to basically wait until you're having one of those episodes and then be like, Oh, I'm going to go get tested, which nobody wants to do when you're no. having that episode. No. I describe mast cell episodes for me, it felt like I was having a panic attack and about to throw up all at once and just like completely debilitated. And, but other people have different presentations, right? It can be hives. um, It can be swelling of the throat, which is really scary. And so sometimes I think pharmaceuticals are absolutely indicated if they're working, but sometimes I've had patients use them and they don't work. Uh, So skull cap was one. 
I have used quercetin can be really helpful, but we do have to be careful because I believe that there is a SNP association there that for some people it actually doesn't help or can make things a little bit worse. Um, but those are usually my, my go-tos. I usually start with skull cap, um, for that cell danger. There seems to be a direct correlation with the cell danger response and histamine release too, you know, and it makes sense. Like with the mast cells, it's the body feels like it needs to release and, and all this histamine is happening. So that would be kind of my number one thing. And like, honestly, uh, I guess with the mast cells, is it just seems like if it's still really bad, that usually it's because they're, we have to lower the exposure, whether it's mold or whatnot. It just seems like we have to stop those aggravating factors. Uh, I don't know if it's just because I am taking on more chronic illness patients the last few years, or if it has to do with how much stress the world has been under the last two years and the ramifications that the pandemic with that infection, how that impacts mast cells. But I am seeing a lot of that. And I'm also very open to any suggestions that or things that are working for you, because that has been a challenge for sure to get that under control. Yeah. Um, well, thank, thanks for the feedback. Um, yeah, I, I find it's really patient dependent. Um, I find sometimes a low histamine diet is helpful, although not always. Um, I, I like quercetin as well, kind of dosing it fairly robustly. Uh, I find that's oftentimes helpful. I find getting the um, uh, H1 receptor blockers um, on board is oftentimes helpful, although I always recommend for my patients that they titrate up the dose because, of course, you can get that histamine flooding effect if you, you know, aren't uh, careful. Because, of course, there's four subtypes of histamine receptors. Um, also, another shout out to Dr. Polly Anderson because I learned that most of what I know about histamine from him. I at least got my foundational uh, footing from him. Um, and uh, I've I've found some patients have done. I've noticed a significant mast cell stabil stabilizing effect with some patients with liposomal glutathione. Um, I have theories as to why that's the case, but uh, I don't know definitively. Um, haven't been able to find any studies on it. Like I went PubMedding a couple of times, just trying to find some literature looking at that directly and haven't been able to find anything, but um, I think it probably helps with just stabilizing their, their cell membranes would be my guess. Um, and then just some other things, like I find PEA has been like really, really hit and miss in my practice. I know some clinicians just love it. I, I um, had the opportunity to um, interview uh, Dr. Jill Krista a couple of weeks ago. I haven't launched that uh, or aired that <clears throat> episode yet, but she was, uh, and I, I forgot um, her, her, she talked about it in her course, um, just using nettles and she's had great results with that. So that's something I've got to circle back around to is I haven't played around with that enough, but um and then also just, um, I find sometimes adding in extra binders is helpful if it's a mold related thing or, or even maybe other, um, you know, even toxicants or whatnot, um, where I find sometimes, um, modified citrus pectin has been really helpful as a binder, um, just where to my understanding, it's actually able to, if it's a small enough molecular size, it's actually able to get into the bloodstream. So I kind of conceptualize it as being like a systemic binder, which is kind of rarish, I think like I, I charcoal to my understanding, bentonite clay, things like that. I don't believe are able to absorb past the GI tract. Um, I think chlorella does, but I don't think it's like super, super strong. So I found modified citrus pectin to be helpful. It's just, I don't know what it's like in the States, but it's really, really expensive here in Canada, um, unfortunately. So it's one we don't prescribe all the time, but it can be helpful. So a couple of tidbits there. Um, um, I'm going to move on to the next uh, topic, unless there's anything else you wanted to say about that. Um, Dr. Casey. No, that's great. I, the thing that came to mind was the binders and then also, um, B5, because that is in a pathway with histamine. And, um, I know that Dr. Paul Anderson, if somebody is having a lot of anxiety and neuro presentations will use pregnenolone or some of those neurosteroids to try and calm. So again, like you're saying, it depends on the patient and, mm -hmm. uh, anxiety is a, can be a symptom from histamine that oftentimes I think gets missed and that we don't associate. I've had patients get put on pharmaceutical anti-anxiety meds and not have any improvement because it's histamine driving it and not an imbalance in their neurotransmitters. Yep. 
Yeah, the histamine, uh, it was just so important to have that on the radar because, yeah, it's, it's not always an obvious presentation. It's like, oh, there's no hives. It's not histamine. Like, if only, no, definitely can be more subtle than that for sure. Um, <clears throat> one of the uh, other things I wanted to ask you about is um, just where, you know, so many patients with chronic illness have impaired detox pathways. And I'm just wondering um, how uh, often you find that patients um, need to get rid of um, heavy metals to kind of get to the finish line in terms of achieving their health goals? Um, is it a rare thing? Do you see it all the time? Uh, I know a lot of patients will test positive for elevated heavy metals, but um, you know, getting rid of them, does it always have a positive, uh, like an obvious clinical impact? So um, how, how often would you say it's really crucial to address heavy metals with your patient population? Well, I think that if you go looking for heavy metals, a lot of times, you know, they're there and then it's, is it, is it something that is going to move the needle or we have to be really careful with heavy metals as Dr. Raid knows that when we start to pull them out, a lot of them mobilize really quickly, depending on what we're using. And so sometimes when we do that, they feel, they feel worse. So we have to really have the right binders on, make sure that before we do that, they are moving lymph, they are having regular bowel movements, hydrated, all of that. And so with heavy metals, uh, I start with a clinical history to gauge how likely that is. Um, because again, we're always having to prioritize, like if, if, okay, it looks like mold is more likely than heavy metals, then we might do that first. But then if they're still not getting better or there's symptoms that seem more heavy metal, like, then we might go back and say, okay, I think we need to check this. Uh, like Dr. Raid said, heavy metals, it is good because testing is a little bit more linear, although heavy metals like to spend, hang out in your tissues, they settle there. And so sometimes we have more heavy metals in us than what we are excreting in our urine. So it can be difficult. Sometimes we need to provoke the test, things like that. Uh, so I, I do find that that is a big piece of the puzzle and very important, especially if they're there, if we know that somebody just had mercury fillings removed and, and things like that, or they have a history of living somewhere where there was exposure, then we absolutely want to deal with those um, if mold is involved and the symptoms are more mold, like I usually start with that because mold seems to be so, so aggravating to mast cells and histamine and, and all of that. But yeah, if there's heavy metals there, we definitely need to address them. Um, that's great. And, um, have you had patients like outside of like an acute, you know, mono or something like that? Um, like, have you had patients where, you found, you know, lab evidence of reactive EBV and, you know, try as you might based on like, you know, thorough history and maybe additional testing or whatnot, you really just haven't found anything else to be a contributing factor. Like it's just all you can seem to find is mono and like that's or um, EBV rather. And that's, you know, ultimately all that needs to be done for treatment. And this is, you know, not an acute case, like say a chronic case. Have you ever seen a case like that? Or has there always been some, some other thing or things afoot? You know, when I was a newer doctor, I think I would say, yeah, but now when I, when I know what, what all these different things, I, I don't really think so. And one thing that we haven't talked about that I think is a huge contributor that, um, that is worth bringing up and is also a, um, <laughs> a bucket of worms, so to speak, is parasites. Mm. Um, we can do testing. Nice, we nice can. Fun. That was great. <laughs> yeah, uh, we can do testing for parasites. We can do all that, and it can come up negative because we don't have great testing for parasites, mm -hmm. and that can be a contributing factor. And that can also play into how well we're able to remove toxins and heavy metals because those can be inside the parasite. And if we're not addressing that, then it's still there. And so I try to, in my original clinical assessment and symptoms, you know, tease out if we have symptoms that if anything screams parasites, for example, if we have, um, a lot of times with parasites, people will have a harder time sleeping and have a lot of digestive symptoms or, um, you know, they might have different skin things or itchiness that's happening and, and can key us into parasites more. 
but a lot of times we can say, oh, we're going to do a stool test. It comes back negative. And I still think, wow, I really think there's parasites here and parasites are much more common than we are taught in medicine. And so I really, it may be somebody doesn't have parasites. They don't have mold. They don't have toxins. They don't have glyphosate. They don't have any of that. But then I would want to ask, what was their childhood like? How are they going through the world? Um, are they constantly in a fight or flight state? Because if that's happening, then that's another reason that Epstein-Barr virus can be stuck. And so if we went through all of those things, I would be very surprised if we found somebody that just had, just had chronic or reactivated EBV and just had it and didn't have any of those things. Good. Well put. And that's the same answer I would give as well. Um, and, and so I, I think, uh, hopefully we can agree a take home message would be if, you know, you're, um, if, uh, hmm, let's see here, how to word this without, uh, giving any advice to people. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, we could probably both agree that, um, EBV, um, in chronic cases rarely stands alone, maybe never stands alone. There's, uh, in our experience, always something else um, going on. And um, I think that it's, I know it's important for me as a clinician where if, you know, the only labs I have, you know, a patient comes in, like the only thing they found is this reactivated EBV. Um, I'm thinking, okay, there's definitely some other stuff that we've got to unearth here because it's rare that you're going to get a full resolution of symptoms just going after the EBV itself. Um, so, oh shoot. Okay. I want to ask you one more quick question. And then I have a, just sort of a closing question to ask you. Uh, but to just in, in, say you had a patient, um, who you thought, you know, might have a parasite issue, you know, testing came back negative, but you want to just run a therapeutic trial. So you don't know what type of parasite you're dealing with. Um, would you mind just speaking to the types of agents that you would use to run a therapeutic trial to explore parasites? Yeah, I actually saw you post about this on your Instagram and I liked your response with this too. Uh, I try to pick a, a supplement that is herbal because even if we don't have parasites, the herbs have multi-actions and it will be beneficial for helping optimize your gastrointestinal health. Mm -hmm. And so that is usually where I start when we're trying a therapeutic dose. There's a lot of different tinctures out there that have different blends. Um, a lot of them have black walnut, which, so I always ask the patient, you know, if they have any nut allergies or things like that. Um, and then from there, like if it is positive, one of the first signs, unfortunately will be sometimes the patient has some GI cramping or something mm -hmm. like that, which that can be tricky because herbs can increase the way that we're digesting and, and cause some of that. So we kind of have to play it out and see, okay, after we do that, do you feel better? Um, and then of course there's pharmaceuticals and I'm not opposed to using those pharmaceuticals for parasites because they are very effective and streamlined to that. Whereas, you know, the herbs we're talking have different modalities, but I usually mm -hmm. start with in herb, um, that way really the biggest side effect is going to be, Oh, we optimized your gastrointestinal health. Mm -hmm. It's not a bad side effect. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I could, I could pick your brain, uh, I think for another hour easily, uh, Dr. Casey, but, uh, I know, I know you've got to run and I've got to run too. Uh, just before we part ways though, um, uh, if, you know, someone listening is feeling like, oh my gosh, like, you know, I'd really like to work with Dr. Casey, um, or access your brain in some other way. Um, are there ways that folks can consult, uh, like you can, and, and say they don't happen to live in a state where you hold a license. So I know before we went, uh, I started the recording, you said you have a license in California and in Montana, uh, I, I believe. So you can work with patients mm -hmm. directly in those two states. Um, California, Montana, and Alaska. Oh, and Alaska. Of course. Mm -hmm. Can't forget Alaska. <laughs> um, so uh, if a patient is outside of one of those states, uh, so they can't work with you um, directly unless they you know, fly or drive there, um, how could they work with you? Or, or do you have other offerings um, for folks um, besides just one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, consultation or, or are you consulting on their case? Yeah, uh, we have the EBV bootcamp, which is designed to talk about everything that Dr. Raid and I just talked about. So we're not just focusing on EBV, but helping you understand what could be contributing to your reactivation. 
uh, that goal of that program has been to bring awareness and to empower people to prevent reactivations throughout their entire life so that they are aware of all of this, just like we talked about today. Um, and then I have, a I do go live monthly where members can pick what they want to talk about. And we do a live Q and a, and just talk through things like this. Um, so both of those are available on my website at drcaseyholland.com. Um, and so just to clarify, um, is the bootcamp offering and the monthly live Q and a, are those two separate things people can sign up for, or is it all kind of like a one it's all together? Uh, they're separate. Okay. So if people don't have like specifically EBV or want to talk about other things, mm -hmm. uh, there's that monthly membership and then the EBV boot camp, though it does have live Q and A where, yeah. you know, um, somebody can talk about their experience and I can say, oh, well, you lived here for five years. Sounds like things got worse there. Sometimes it just talking about our stories, right. And having somebody help connect the dots mm -hmm. and working through things if they have questions about the content in the boot camp. Mm -hmm. Um, and then if somebody did want you to uh, work with them, um, either directly or, or with, you know, through their clinician, if they're in a different state, do, actually, sorry, I should, should not assume, do you, do you do offer that? Um, like if someone say in, you know, New York state, for example, or, or, uh, you know, Manitoba, Canada or something or wherever, like, um, are, are there ways that they can work with you, um, in some way, shape or form, or do they have to be in your, in one of those three states where you hold the license? Um, if they're outside of those and they can't travel, then uh, I am happy to talk with their primary care provider or their functional medicine doctor and work with them. Um, obviously, there's legalities and some of that changes depending on what state they're actually in with what I'm allowed to do. So the best thing to do is um, on my website, there's a discovery call link and there's a little form and you put in what state, what you need help with. And then in our discovery call, we can talk about how that would work and what tools we would need to implement to, to make that possible. Awesome. Great. I will uh, put links to all those um, offerings in the show notes. So it'll all be accessible for folks who are listening. Um, Dr. Casey, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Um, it was lots of fun. I'm glad we got to connect directly. We've, you know, kind of seen each other on social media, but never actually had a chance to chat before. So this has been nice and, uh, thanks so much for your time and I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It was an honor. Well, thank you. Uh, well, thanks to everyone for listening to this episode of the, or <clears throat> excuse me, overcoming chronic illness podcast, and we will leave it there for now.